Hello everyone, welcome to the MuseScore Cafe for today, uh, Wednesday, I'm looking at the date, October 7th, uh, 2020. My name is Mark Sabatella, the director of the Mastering MuseScore School, and uh, this is my weekly series, the MuseScore Cafe, where I talk about some aspect of making music with MuseScore. So uh, hello everyone, I see we already have uh, some activity in chat, so I need to, uh, to uh, get that. Um, up where I can see it a little more. My name is Mark Sabatella, the director of the Mastering MuseScore School, and uh, there we go. Okay, um, so uh, yes, hello everyone who's um, <clears throat> checking in from various places around the world, and um, okay, uh, yeah, remember to select live chat. I will select live chat here, and I will select I already did on my phone, so that's good. Um, all right, so the thing that I learned last time, and now I remember that's the thing I forgot to check on, was how to convince YouTube to let people post links in the chat, because that's still not... Um, ah, that was now uh, what I'm remembering was the thing uh, that was uh, hitting, hitting me... Uh, being problematic last time. So anyhow, uh, I'm. <clears throat> if people have links they want to post, um, you can maybe just go to the MuseScore Cafe uh, um, page uh, on MuseScore.com, the group on MuseScore.com here. So I'm going to post that link because I am allowed to post links because, um, you know, I'm special. Uh, hello, Howard. Um, so here is the group on musecore.com. All right. So um, I must also apologize for uh, the fact that I was a little distracted coming in in that we're imminently getting ready to release MuseScore 3.5.1. Um, it's just a kind of a bug fix update to 3.5 that came out a few weeks ago. Um, maybe a little more than just a bug fix because we've actually, you know, thrown a bunch more stuff in, but we're having some, <laughs> uh, discovered some problems uh, last minute that I'm uh, attempting to deal with also. So uh, I'm putting that, um, putting that aside and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, getting on with uh, getting on with this. So uh, my plan today is, you know, so my the theme as I chose has to do with writing for voices, which is of course what we're doing. And so last time we specifically looked at harmony. This time maybe not as much, except when it comes up. But I want to um, look at some of the scores that other people have posted that I have um, here, and some of these. We've heard or seen uh, some of them, not as much. Uh, and one of them, so Andrew, are you here? I didn't, uh, did I see Andrew Mason? Yes, Andrew. So um, I just posted a comment on your score. I'm not able to download the thing. Uh, and, oh, Andy Monger, sorry, not Andrew Mason. Wrong, wrong Andy. Um, so, uh, Andy Monger, if you're if you are around, this is a private score, and uh, so we can see it because it's shared in the group. But apparently, we cannot download it. So I can play it from from MuseScore.com, but I won't be able to load it into um, MuseScore in, unless uh, that uh, gets uh, changed. So that's something to be aware of. All right, I'm going to pop out my chat so it's easier to come back to. And I'm also going to uh, turn on my uh, key, keystroke logger thingy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, Autumn within to main sheet. So that that's fine. If you've if you've uploaded it, that's great. And then if you can just add it to the group, you're right. It did. Okay. I was actually going to check and see if it did that, but I was like, no, it won't be that stupid, but apparently it is. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I have, uh, you know, a number of things about uh, um, writing for voices that I want to talk about. Uh, and we'll look at people's uh, pieces as examples. And... Um, 
and then whatever questions come up, feel free to ask. And uh, let's just go. So this is the piece. I'm going to start with this piece that we uh, listened to last time. And I'm going to start it and um, maybe not play the whole thing through because I want to talk about a few things as we, uh, as we move. So one of the things about writing for voices is deciding, uh, well, how many voices you're writing for and... Um, how you're going to use those voices, I guess. So uh, Kirk's piece here is fascinating to me because when it started, I was like, oh, maybe he doesn't get the concept because, you know, I don't know anything about you. Um, but, okay, so he, here's why I thought that as we hear the beginning. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming you all can hear. Um, so assuming that everyone can hear, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stupidity to go around in the world. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, the thing is all those voices are in unison and if the whole piece had been that way, I would have said, okay, well, you know, there was a miscommunication about what's going on here, but in fact, that is not the case, right? The whole piece is not in unison. So he's using unison as a device, as a, a plot device, as it were, um, to start the piece off, um, starting the piece off in unison and then eventually breaking into harmony. That's as much as it's unison. Now it's about to start breaking up a little bit. And I say it's breaking up a little bit into harmony, um, but uh, a little bit, right? Because the top two voices are still together. Da, 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 da. And the bottom voices. Da, 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 da. So the, the two voices and, and the bottom two voices so the um top and the bottom the top two voices and the bottom two voices are both together so really we have only two part harmony here so it's gradually working into uh, harmony and now we're kind of breaking into a little more harmony here the top two voices are together Da, da, da. But the bottom two voices are independent. So it's still gradually expanding. We're in three-part harmony at this point. Um, it's still been only two-part harmony even in the previous measure. And two-part harmony in which there's some amount of unison. The first note of every measure is unison. And the um, uh, first note... Of the, of the previous measure was unison. And I, I, I mention this because this is a really important consideration when you're writing uh, for any sort of ensemble that I will absolutely admit to being guilty of not paying attention to enough. I, if I'm writing for an ensemble, whether it's four voices or whether it's a 20 piece orchestra or whatever, I have this notion that I've got to write for all the instruments all the time, or that because I can write for all the instruments that I should. And the reality is, no, you're very often better off changing texture as you write. So by using unison in some places and then uh, splitting into harmony, we get that texture. Now, you also could have done it by saying, hey, let's just have only sopranos and altos. Let's have the tenors and basses not go at all. Or if you wanted the octave happening, could have been just the sopranos and the tenors and, let, and left the altos and basses out of it. So it would be not just a thinner texture in terms of how big the chord is, but also... Um, how many voices are singing at once, having fewer voices singing, even when just having, even if they're all singing the same notes, fewer voices is a nice sound, and then it can expand to more voices. That's a third thing that could have happened. Instead of starting with all the voices together, we could have started with just sopranos, then gone to just sopranos and tenors, then gone to all voices, 
still in unison. And that would have been another way of gradually building up this texture. So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what I would have done. But the point is that Kirk is doing a wonderful thing here in really gradually opening all of this up. Um, and yeah, I get, uh, uh, I get a, uh, um, a lovely fall day here. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know what the temperature is outside. And most of you people who are in Europe wouldn't know if I told you it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's what, 20 or something Celsius, um, ish. Uh, but yeah, that's about what it's probably like right now. All right. So let's, uh, I just selected somewhere and that's not where we actually ended, but, uh, it's, um, right here is about where we ended four part harmony, three part harmony. He's still um, hedging, holding back, and not using. I mean, even though he went into three part harmony in this measure, it's not it's three part harmony because we have an A, a C sharp, and an E. He's still not consistently giving us three part harmony yet, still holding back. Right? And at that point, uh, it's still just two part harmony. Now I think we're finally going to start a little more four part. And it's still the case that the soprano and alto occasionally um, uh, uh, soprano and alto are still together. So that's interesting that uh, that Fahrenheit is still uh, uh, is still thought of by some people. Uh, I don't know when you all switched over. They tried to get the United States to switch over in the seventies, and no one no one went for it. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's still the case that it's. Uh, occasionally splitting into four parts, occasionally splitting into three, but more often just being two parts. Um, and in fact, here we really have two part harmony because it's three D's and one F sharp, even though the previous measure had two E's, but then also a G and an A, right? So it's, it's really doing a masterful job of building this. And now... Right. So now we finally have full for full part harmony. And not only that, but also the Sopranos have, I mean, because the Sopranos were down here in the same octave as the altos and frankly, the same octave that the tenors are in. Um, the tenor, by the way, oh, so here's the thing. And those of you who are in choirs, I would love, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I was definitely thinking 21 was about right. Um, so, uh, um, I, I, uh, continue to, um, uh, confuse myself. Oh, so this clef, um, this treble clef with an eight below it. So those of you who actually, uh, sing in choirs, I'm curious to, to know your impression of this. In particular, the tenor part is often in, often I don't know how often, but somewhat often written in this clef, where this B here, it's written to be the B above middle C, but because we're in this clef, that's a transposing clef, it's an, an octave clef, it's sometimes called, um, this B is actually the B below middle C. And this tends to be the most convenient clef for tenors to read, because then you, they can read treble clef, assuming that like most people were more comfortable reading tre treble clef, and yet... Uh, you know, the actual range of a tenor extends from a little above middle C to a little below middle C, say half an octave above middle C to an octave below. Um, so it kind of doesn't, you're going to need ledger lines, whether you use treble clef or bass clef. By using uh, this clef here, you can avoid needing a lot of ledger lines. So um, 
Yeah, I see. So when you say that it's uh, the reason that m music in, in uh, bass clef is why you started using music score, so you could rewrite it into, into treble clef? Gotcha. Okay, yeah. So the thing is, when you're writing in four uh, staves like this, then it's very typical that this is the clef that you get used. When you're writing in two staves, which... Uh, I don't have an example of handy, but you've all seen that because I showed it last time. When you're writing uh, music for, I'll use the choral SATB closed score, um, in this type of thing, uh, actually, you know, so we might go C and then in voice two, we might have an E. And then down here, we might have in voice one, say, a G. And then in voice two, say, C. So the tenors would be reading the upper part of the bottom staff in bass clef. So when you're reading closed score music, which is what we call this, um, the tenors will have to read bass clef. And so that's kind of a drag. Um, so tenors generally want it the other way. Yeah, um, that's... That's, uh, that is good to know for people who are writing uh, writing for uh, any sort of choral music, that that is going to be the case, that we're going to want this. So anyhow, my point uh, in having mentioned the clef is that actually the notes that the tenor are singing are almost the same uh, pitch level as what the alto is singing. Um, so for instance, uh, at least in some places, uh, so like, well, I guess this is an octave below. Um, but there are some places here where the, uh, like here, this note or this C sharp is only just a half step below where the alto is here, right? Um, so the tenor and all four voices are very close. And that in itself is a consideration. Um, what's called close voicing, meaning all four voices are within an octave some people, depending on what's going on, uh, some people might separate the bass out from that and say, well, the bass could be as low as it wants, but as long as the top three voices are within an octave, we'll call that a close position voicing. Um, so this is all close position. Once we get here, we finally have the bass at least being more than an octave from the other voices. Um, but now here is where we finally get big open voices, voicings, where the space between the bass and the soprano is almost two octaves. So beautiful harmonies in there. Um, so I, I said I'm not going to focus too much on harmonies because that's what I focused on last time. But, you know, I, I, I can't not uh, appreciate lovely harmony when I hear it. Some of the things that I, I will call attention to about it is there, there's different kind of languages, for lack of a better word, for how we might think about harmony. Um, and... Uh, this is using a language that I don't know if who, like how, if, what kind of name I would put on what it is. It's not jazz harmony, but it's not uh, traditional classical uh, harmonies either. It's the harmony of modern choral music. And there are any number of composers who are like really big names in this world that we could uh, um, liken it to. But uh, like this sound right here, what's happening here is not a triad. We have an A, we have another A, and then we have a, a B and a D. That sound itself is not directly related to any particular triad, right? It's, um, uh, um, an A, a B, and a D. It's 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 its own type of chord. It's a if if we think of A as being the root of that chord, we could say that B is a second and D is a fourth. We could try to imagine that B is the root of the chord and say, well, really, this is a B minor seventh, a B, a D, and a couple of A's. I don't know that that's 
necessarily the smartest way of looking at it. Although we do get, uh, well, no, it's just, I don't know that that actually makes a uh, functional sense. So I don't know if Kirk is here and wants to talk about his, uh, um, actual thinking. Um, yeah, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't know if it, what his actual thinking is here, but, um, that kind of sound where you're allowing there to be certain dissonances, like the dissonance between the A and the B, a second. And seconds, I, that dissonance is all over Bach as well, but it would be part of a seventh chord or part of a suspension where it resolves in a very specific way. And what's happening in this piece is certain of these dissonances are are uh, used in a more daring way. I say daring, but again, daring with a lot of history of its own behind uh, this kind of sound. And again, uh, you know, I could go through all these things and talk about all the different places where there's chords that vaguely resemble seventh chords, but aren't functioning in a normal seventh chord way. This chord here, we have an E here and an F sharp there, which are, you know, a seventh apart. And this is an F sharp seven chord, if we want to look at it. And actually, I would say, okay, F sharp minor seven, and this adds up to a B minor seven. So there's some circle of fifth stuff going on here. Um, F sharp, uh, so Kirk. Um, B minor seven to G. Yeah, so you are thinking B minor seven. That's good to know because this is indeed a G chord. But then I would say that that type of thinking in itself. So yeah, this is, I said, uh, a B, a D, and a couple of A's. So it is kind of a B minor seven chord, but it's missing the fifth and it's got two sevenths. And that's not a typical Bach type or Beethoven or Mozart or whoever might have used uh, seventh chords and furthermore resolving a B minor seven to a V triad, which is what we have here, G, B, and D, that's not a typical resolution of the seventh. So it's a much freer use of that seventh chord sonority, both in terms of how it's voiced and how it's resolved. And so to me, this is very in keeping with how a lot of uh, you know, modern choral music is written, and it's it's using language that maybe comes a little bit from jazz vernacular, but isn't really going there either. It's just borrowing little bits of freer use of seventh chords and so forth, and whether it's coming by way of jazz or coming by way of Debussy, it's hard to even say, but it's, um, it's a lovely thing. So what's actually happening here is a circle of fifths uh, kind of thing here. I see an F sharp minor chord here and a B minor kind of chord here. And then this chord here uh, is some sort of dominant seventh type of sound. Yeah, so there's, there's this lovely motion in here that um, I would have to go through and add it all up, or Kirk, you could tell me what it all adds up to. But, um, you know, I there's a augmented sixth chord uh, you know, I called it a dominant seventh sound, but the way it's spelt, it's spelt as a what's called an augmented sixth chord. And I don't know if that was your your intent, but that is in fact what's happening. So, in the key of in the key of B minor, um, this would be this would be the uh, uh, German augmented sixth chord for people who are keeping score at home. And uh, if you're wanting to learn much more about that kind of language. You can uh, jump into uh, my my harmony course and um, and have a ball learning all about augmented sixth chords. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's just a beautiful sound. Um, and then uh, and then we're going to this other sound. So yeah, there's there's um, another F sharp F sharp to D sharp to A to C sharp. I'm not even sure what this is adding up to. Uh, 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 D sharp could be the root, and then F sharp, and then A, and then C sharp, a, 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 a C sharp, a, a, a D sharp half diminished chord. So yeah, the, what's going on harmonically here is very sophisticated. Um, so it's last time I was talking about how much, how much, 
how much you can do with nothing but diatonic chords and secondary dominance, you can do an unbelievable amount. What Kirk is doing here is way, way beyond that. It's using seventh chords in sort of non-traditional ways. It's using this not this uh, uh, augmented augmented sixth chord, which a jazz musician might call a tritone substitution. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, so yeah, th this this chromatic descending motion here definitely has this falling uh, sense to it. It's curious uh, in that the way it's all moving down in half step and also the sense of circle of fifths, like from here to there, to there to this, and then this sound, this dominant seventh, going to this dominant seventh, a half step below, there's an element to this that feels like the types of harmony that's used in barbershop music. And uh, one of the other pieces that was posted was someone who sings in a barbershop quartet and, and posted an arrangement that he was trying to make in barbershop style. And I would love to engage more about that when we can also. Um, and again, I don't know if Andy, uh, where is it? This, this fellow here. No, no. Um, Andy Monger, if if you are here, it's uh, definitely the case that I, I would love to look at this. But this was specifically written to be uh, a uh, in barbershop style. Um, so uh, anyhow, the types of harmonies that are used are actually reminiscent a little bit about that, the way that all these chromatic motions work and we have all these chords. So it's very lovely. And um, since I'm talking about also just the general things and I've talked about the texture and the four voice texture. Uh, I will say the all the voices are also moving in parallel, right? They're falling in parallel and that fits with what you're talking about. I contrast this with what's happening at the beginning. When it first started splitting into harmony, uh, it was by using contrary motion, right? where two voices are going down, two voices going up. Contrary motion is a great uh, device to be using, as is parallel motion. And so um, writing for voices, one of the things that's involved is uh, um, balancing these things. When do you want to write parallel? When do you want to write contrary motion? So. Um, and this is really uh, well thought out in that, like you said, you're you're thinking about. Uh, sometimes we call this word painting, where you're thinking about the the meaning of the lyrics and are doing things with the melody to reinforce what's happening in the lyrics. So fall leaves fall, and the melody is falling there. So that's sometimes called word painting. Um, word painting? Is that the, am I using the right word? I think I am. Um, yeah. Uh, and so we, we continue with this uh, kind of descending. Okay, so there again is that same kind of sound that I'm talking about. These sounds here, this triad here is like a G. Uh, what do we have? A G, a D, and then an A and a C sharp. And then that C sharp is sort of functioning as a non-chord tone. It's coming down to B. And then I can hear this more clearly as a G triad, but it's a G triad with an added A. So again, we're using this sort of, this harmony that's really, it's, um, it's I don't know where this first came from, this idea of a major triad with an added second, but I will tell you, uh, that it's all over pop piano playing from like, you know, the 60s and 70s. It's uh, all over things like, um, yeah, just all sorts of pop songs where there's a pianist playing, doing things like the following. Uh, this. That kind of sound, or that same thing down an octave. Maybe slower would be a little more to the point. That kind of sound is all over pop piano playing um, 
really I associate it as, as a very 70s kind of sound, although it, you know, it predates that. And I don't know how it entered the rest of the, the vernacular as far as arranging for other types of ensembles, because certainly the idea of adding seconds or ninths to chords has been in jazz a lot longer than that, but it really became a thing outside the jazz world through music, a, a lot of these pop songs. And I, I sort of wonder if that's also how it entered the uh, choral vocabulary, although I guess I don't really, I don't really know. Um, anyhow, uh, so uh, just I'm looking at, you know, other things that I can talk about so I don't uh, bury myself just talking about harmony, um, but it's such a, a, just a lovely piece to talk about so many different things. This is the first time we've gotten a really big full chord with bass really down in the bass range. And there's another thing that's really, to me, masterful about, Kirk, how you are uh, handling this arrangement. The bass has mostly been... Uh, upper half of that bottom staff, right? It's been mostly, in fact, I'm just gonna switch to continuous view here. By the way, uh, I am using a uh, pre-release build of 3.5.1, uh, which fixes a bug that was in the original 3.5 where repeats in continuous view just didn't work. Now they do. So there is that. Except now I don't know where the heck I am, so that's a drag. Um, uh, but I can tell where I'm at. So yeah, if I'm looking at the bass part, it's mostly top half of the staff other than this one chord, the last chord before it uh, split up into more. Actually, it was this chord I was thinking of. This is right before it goes into the really big harmony. Then when it did that big part there, the bass was up high again. And so it's the sopranos and everyone else is up high, but the bass is up high also. So it's still not as big of a chord as it's eventually going to become. This is when it finally becomes a really big chord. Right, the bass coming down here while we have the rest of the notes all spread out so that there is now a two octave spread between the bass and the top note with the bass down in the actual bass range. And Great. I'm glad you guys are enjoying the, the things that I'm pointing out here. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just loving going through and, and uh, seeing what we can learn from the, uh, the, the way that people are, are doing their, their pieces here. And um, yeah, this has just got so many nice things happening here. All right. So yeah, what's happening there harmonically would also take a little minute to, uh, to dive into. Um, now here I might question the spelling, whether it really made sense to spell these things with sharps, because what I'm hearing this chord is an F major triad by another name, right? We have E sharp, which might as well be F. We have A, and we have A again, and then we have B sharp. That might as well be C. So to me, this is an F major triad um, spelt differently, and I would spell it with an E sharp Perhaps if this line were ascending, the fact that it's descending, I'm not sure what the what the rationale is behind that spelling there. So I, I don't know that it's doing any favors to anyone other than, you know, if we think, oh, we're in a sharp key, we should use sharps. But I, I don't I don't know that that's a good enough reason personally. And this is basically a C major triad. Uh, C, E, G. This is basically a E flat triad, D sharp, which is E flat, G, and B flat. So to me, this, you know, F, uh, F, C, B flat, and then the, and now we're back into we're back into some sort of sharp type language again. So that could have been the reason not to spell everything with flats because we are coming back into a uh, sharp world here of uh, F sharp, A, C sharp. 
Uh, wait a minute. What, what am I hearing wrong here? F sharp. Oh, that's an A sharp. Okay. I was wondering why it sounded major because that's an A sharp. F sharp, A sharp, um, C sharp. Although that could have been spelled G flat had we wanted to. Um, but this is what happens when... Um, okay. Yeah. That, that's... Uh, it, it's it's not bad the way it is because there is some logical basis for it because we are in a sharp key and we're about to return to more diatonic chords. It's not necessarily a problem this way, um, but it is something to be aware of. When you do write highly chromatic music, often there's no right answer because we're going to rely on a chord maybe or a note having more than one function. Like it might be F sharp relative to what was happening before it, but G flat relative to what's happening after it and so forth. So when you're writing music in which the chords are starting to be used in non-traditional ways relative to the key, and again, by non-traditional, I mean not Bach, not Mozart. I don't mean without precedent because there's a huge precedent. The last half century worth of, of choral music is, uh, or not just choral music, but Again, from Debussy on, this stuff is uh, quite common to have, and, and if for that matter, even Chopin. So um, uh, the, the idea that there's interesting games to be spelt with the uh, spelling of, of notes and that you have to figure out the, the most logical spelling that will make it feel connected to what came before, but also came, what comes after. And if there's a modulation coming, as there is, that also changes that changes things. So anyhow, moving on. Then there's an actual key change, and so that's just, that's just a beautiful device to change key to you know bring up some new element of of things, um, introduce some sort of mood change. And I I do, I do want to just talk about a couple other things about what's happening. Um, one of the other devices worth worth mentioning here is throughout this arrangement, it's mostly what what I would call chorale style, meaning every voice has the same rhythm. Right, it's mostly quarter notes, two quarter notes and a half note, and for the most part, it's consistent about that. There's only a couple places, like this measure here, where one voice moves while the others stay still, and that's you know typical in chorales. There would be a couple places where that happens, but it's actually very restrained in its use of that. I mean, Bach, if he was writing a chorale, would have much more of that. And then it, it creates a sound, but it, it creates a more cluttered sound. There's a certain simplicity of, of not doing that except when really necessary. And here, this uh, sound, which I might call a suspension, even though technically it's not because this E sharp is not prepared, but this is basically a B chord. Uh, we have a B, a D sharp, and an F sharp with a fourth sounding. This is actually technically an appositura, not a suspension, but it's a sound that we've heard a million times as a suspension where that E would have been held over from a previous chord. So there, you know, it was almost necessary to have that tenor voice move like that, although not totally. You could have just gone straight to the D sharp. But in any case, it's interesting because that's setting up for the first time that D sharp. In fact, I think. Well, during these chromatic places, we, we had that. But during the places where it wasn't moving so much, we, we certainly didn't have such a prominent use of, it, of, of, of that type of chromaticism. Then uh, it's sort of setting us up for this section here where we're finally going to get... This is all diatonic again. E minor. And we've established now B minor as our as our new key instead of D major. Whether it was D major before or not doesn't matter. B minor, D major, right? Two sharps as our key. At this point, um, we don't know. Are we going to D 
or are we going to a B minor again? We're not sure because we've just had a cadence into B minor. And now we've got this A chord here, which could have been the five chord in D. So maybe we're coming back to a D or maybe we're going to a B minor. But what actually happened is the major chord. So this is a device harmonically that's referred to as a Picardy third. Um, and anyone who speaks French could tell me a better way of pronouncing that. I would love it. But I'm commi pretty committed to calling it Picardy at this point. Um, but uh, um, it's when you're expecting something to go to a minor one chord and you actually go to a major chord instead. And then it, that happens, and then it immediately becomes not the one chord, but actually the five chord in the new key. And that's how he's setting up this modulation to the key of E, modulation to E. I always wanted to be Picardy third, but I think it's not actually. I think actually Picardy or something like that, uh, like Chef Boyardee, I think might be a more appropriate one. But I, I, you know, because I, I, I would have to hear someone, uh, someone really French say it. Um, but uh, this is a lot of the same type of material that we had before, but now in the key of E. Um, and then uh Again, beautiful, Kirk. Um, and at the end here, so we get that slowing down, but not only that, but it's also a little bit of a return to the type of sounds we had at the beginning, because there's a little more use of unison here, right? Not yet. Not yet. Right there. That unison phrase there is much more like how the piece started. This chord is another one of those chords that's, you know, interesting use of uh, seconds. We have a, you know, we're, we're coming to a cadence on E and we expect some sort of B chord here, but we actually get is a B, another B, D sharp, and an E. So we actually have the fourth in this chord and with no apologies, no, no resolving it down. We have both the fourth and the third. Now, I don't know about you. But as soon as I hear that sound, Thelonious Monk is who, who I know. This is the penultimate chord of Round Midnight. That's the second to last chord in, in Thelonious Monk's composition, Round Midnight. A major chord uh, with a fourth prominent in the melody like that. And then... ...is done in unison also. So, um... So I'm wondering, uh, yeah, decrescendo on that last note could be could be a nice thing, especially given the lyric there. It could be a fall, die out kind of sound. That that could be nice. Which, by the way, if people aren't aware, ever since uh, I don't know, three point one or so in Mu score, that is a thing. So I can certainly add. In fact, I think let me think about this. I think I can add um, decrescendos to all four measures at once. So I've selected them. I clicked this E. And then I'm going to shift click that E. And now I'm going to press the shortcut for decrescendo, which is kind of the greater than sign. And that added uh, decrescendos everywhere on all four staves. And then I can select those four. And I'm just control clicking them. And now I'm going to open the inspector. And I'm just going to set their uh, velocity change to 100. 
And I think I'm supposed to do 100 and not negative 100. Let's find out. Oh, that apparently wasn't right. So uh, it could also be that depending on what how this is set up in the mixer, it might not work for that reason. Let me try negative 100. Nope, doesn't like negative 100. So I think it really is positive. So there's some reason that I'm not sure about why... Uh, why that actually isn't decrescendoing. Let me actually open the mixer and see. Yeah, it does say it's the expressive voices. So there's something going on with it that I'm not sure about, but normally that should actually work. Oh yes, yes, you're right. Uh, in vocal music, these would go on top. And by the way, since, oh, here, here's a here's here's a good thing to know. The, the dynamic markings typically would go above. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of them here and I'm just gonna flip it to the top with X but then I'm also going to press the uh, set. Oh, that's a text line, I see, and not a uh, um, an actual decrescendo. No, it is. Okay, yeah, so here, um, the placement, if I hit the set a style button, that makes all of the decrescendos go above. But unfortunately, they have been manually adjusted, so their position is no longer right. But I might just reset them by click clicking pressing control R to move them above. So these are some things you can do. And so when I did that, that moved all of my uh, um, things below. And I guess that diminuendo line was already extending to the end. And maybe that is actually why these guys weren't having an effect because they weren't necessary. Um, because this one was already in effect, but this one wasn't um, set to do anything. So let me uh, collect all of these guys and now uh, set them to have a hundred as the velocity change. If you enter a final dynamic, you don't need to enter the velocity change in the inspector. There you have it. So maybe maybe that 100 was too extreme, but anyhow, you can play with that. Or if instead of putting a velocity change in the inspector like that, I could have done the same thing by let me uh, select all four of those and reset that velocity change. Um, if I reset that velocity change here, I can then just go to the final note here, select it in all voices, and then open my uh, palettes again and uh, dynamics and add a dynamic there. And these guys also. So apparently, I noticed, Kirk, you had put your dynamics above, but apparently you had done them individually rather than setting it as the style. Because if it had been set as the style, all of these would have automatically showed up above. So if I change it to above and hit set as style, they all go above, but it's Pass up your other no, it doesn't mess up your other one. So we got lucky there. Um, so anyhow, that's something you can do so that now every time you add a dynamic, it'll automatically show up above the staff. So um, oh, by the way, um, for uh, people who have maybe I don't remember if I went into this when I demoed three five a few weeks ago, but here's a here's a nice new uh, feature in uh, um, in uh, 3.5 that uh, people who do a lot of vocal music will love. Notice I'm in continuous view here. I'm going to go back to page view for a second. What if there were multiple verses? Right in, in page view, it automatically adds space. In continuous view, we weren't doing that, but now we do. So there you go. Um, but we don't reclaim that space when you delete it until uh, eventually, if eventually it can. But um, next time it does a full relay out, it will. Uh, so anyhow, now that that double, uh, that, now that the pianissimo, let me flip it back above, I think that'll have the same effect. So 
obviously that didn't work. And I think that's because the diminuendo line is probably overlapping the pianissimo. And I would have to actually, yeah, I would have to actually back it up a little bit to get it to um, not, because so, uh, I think that final pianissimo isn't being noticed because it's overlapping the dynamic line. This would actually work better. So, um, yeah, so it, it is definitely true that back in version two, the one and only thing that MuseScore ever did that was sort of like automatic placement was adding extra space for lyrics. When automatic placement got added, it, it, it improved a million things, but it did mean that it uh, would have slowed down continuous view too much to do that for lyrics. So we had to disable it for lyrics until we found a way to, uh, to get it to be fast. So uh, we have now done that. So now, but all the other things that, uh, like for instance, uh, things like this, score two. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, because again, we're in continuous view. Certain things had to be disabled in continuous view, but in uh, in page view, if I move notes up, the uh, it the the dynamic markings and lines and things happily avoid them, which was something that you know MuseScore two could never do. Um, so let me just undo all these changes because I don't want to mess up. Well, I'm not going to save it anyhow. So anyhow, those are uh, um, those are some things there to uh, to know here. So as far as a shortcut to force a full relay out manually, no. There's uh, there's certain things that happen to do it, and but what I can tell you, if you end up wanting to add some extra space in your like you you want to add some extra um, verses, it's going to add them. It's going to add this. Oh, that's page view. Sorry. Um, in continuous view, it will add them, but again, it won't reclaim them as I delete these verses. So if I delete that, it doesn't reclaim the space until there's a redrawing of until there's a relay out of the whole score. I think things like editing of a line. Uh, I think there's certain things, yeah, I, I forget what actually does, but I can tell you what definitely does is going to page view and back again. And so page view and back will do it. And there is a shortcut for that. I believe it's control shift V. Yeah, control shift V. So control shift V twice will take put you to page view and back to continuous. So that will force a full relay out for people who um, might want to know. Um, Control S, Control W. Well, yeah, that's uh, uh, closing the closing the score and reopening it will do it also. But switching the page and back to continuous is uh, is a little less uh, destructive. Okay, so yeah, because I had played Kirk's last time and I knew there was so much to talk about in it, I definitely wanted to uh, spend some time on it. Um, I am gonna just uh, uh, talk about a couple other things that that have come up. So here's one piece that was submitted. Uh, with someone who was just exploring some ideas. And Deb, I don't know if you're around or or what, but so she's exploring some ideas here. And this is, you know, a work in progress. And one thing I will say is, yeah, it's fine when you're exploring ideas to put everything on one staff like this, but you'll probably want to, as soon as possible, get to two staves at least, so that when you're working out your ideas, they're a little uh, clearer to follow. But there's some amazing stuff that's going on in this piece. I'm I'm just gonna play a little bit. So, like harmonically, I can't even. I, I can't put names. I can put names on a few things that are happening there. Mostly, they're just really interesting sounds that actually have really good voice leading also. And so sometimes if you just play interesting sounds on the piano, they won't translate very well to trying to arrange it for, for a choir. But here, actually, as I'm following the voice leading of what's happening in here, I think this is going to this is going to actually sound really nice, I think, um, if it ever does get kind of completed and scored out. Um, so 
I always have to apologize for the fact that I have no idea how to pronounce anyone's names um, unless their names I already know how to pronounce, right? And so I don't know what uh, G I J S is like. I, you know, I, I just, I just have no idea. I mean, I'm assuming it's like a Dutch uh, type of name. So uh, yeah, so I really apologize for that. Um, so I'm just, um, I'm not even going to try. Um, so, uh, uh, this, I have two different versions of this piece here, and I don't know if you are here and it's not necessarily the same piece, but it's two, uh, pieces with the same lyrics and to some extent, some similarity in the melody, right? Cause the first melody is it's a descending line da, 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 and the second version is is a descending line also, but dis disguised more with the eighth note. So I, I'm not sure, and it's in a different key also. So I'm not sure to what extent it was meant to be an elaboration of the original one or just a complete reimagining of it. And so I want to take a, a, a look at this one next time. And since I, I, I was really hoping Andy Monger would be here so we could talk about the barbershop version, but I'll talk about that next time also. Um, so yeah, there's so many different things to talk about uh, in in this music. So I'm I'm hoping to see some more submissions here and more questions and more whatevers, so we can keep doing things. There's a couple of uh, real specific things about uh, lyrics that almost never came up in uh, Kirk's piece, and that's because Kirk made essentially no use. In fact, I'm just going to close that piece and reopen it because. Did I just save it? How oh, stupid me. Um, that is exactly what I wanted not to do was save it. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I saved it after having added stuff to it. So I'll, I'll re-download it. But that might be the only relevant change. Anyhow, um, there is essentially no use of melisma in here. right? It is it, it completely uh, syllabic. I think is the adjective that we would use. Each syllable gets a single note. There is no fall, right? That doesn't happen almost anywhere in through this whole piece. I mean, I'm looking for the telltale sign of melisma would be what we just saw in this piece uh, here. Uh, mm, which one? Uh, oh, it was, sorry, this one, where we have the long melisma line here indicating that a single syllable is being held over multiple notes. I'll play a little bit of that. So I told you, he says this is barbershop. And it says right here, barbershop four-part harmony, but this is like no barbershop I've ever heard. I haven't heard a ton of barbershop, but I, but I have heard some. Um, and um, it's, it's dark. <laughs> it's beautiful. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next time, I think. But uh, in any case, that use of that melisma, that ooh, being held out while things happen. And um, so... Just to make sure people are clear on a couple of things, I, I will make one comment about melismas uh, because it's something that a lot of people get wrong. Um, if you want to have a single word that is a melisma, like uh, hi, you just extend this line. So I'm hitting as it says right here, shift uh, plus hyphen. It's the underscore base. So I'm just pressing underscore and it's extending it. However, if I want, uh, if instead I want to do hello, then it goes like this. You don't use the melisma line in the middle of a word. You just use the hyphens. So you never use both at the same time. The melisma line is the end. Okay, yeah, 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 I missed the hello. Um, is, what, is, who? 
I dash S should be is. Uh, oh, where are you talking about? Somewhere, oh, one of the other pieces probably. Because um, I didn't enter an I and an S. So yeah, you're probably talking about one of these pieces or somewhere else. Um, but in any case, if so if you are extending the last syllable of a word, you use this melisma line, the underscore. If you're extending an interior syllable, then you use hyphens, just like if it was just hello. If this was going to be hello, ah, there, hello, a hyphen to hyphenate it. And even if the first syllable is extended a bunch, a bunch of over a bunch of notes, you don't use the melisma line. You use the, uh, just use the hyphens. So, um, so anyhow, that's like a thing that I notice a lot of people not getting right. So you, you might want to uh, pay attention to that. And the melisma line continues up until the last note of that melisma. And this is, by the way, something else, mm -hmm. a little small improvement that was made in 3.5 where the exact positioning of the end of the melisma line is improved in 3.5 versus any previous version. Um, and there's there, there were always some cases uh, in MuScore 2 as well as in MuScore 3 where the melisma line could accidentally um, overlap. Like if, if, let me think, hell... Hello, oh, and then if if there was going to be a lyric, I, I forget what the situation was, but there was always going to be some situation where if the if the line got too crowded, um, if the line got too crowded, this um, melisma line could overlap that letter, and that should be fixed in 3.5 also. So I, there's a lot of little improvements like that that were made in 3.5 that probably didn't make the highlight reel when I did a whole cafe on, on the subject, but there, there are a lot of little improvements like that. The last note, including ties. Okay, second line, why not a slur? Oh, um, okay, so there's another thing. Um, by second line, uh, you mean like before I messed it all up, right? So uh, mm -hmm. there's another question. Uh, there is a tradition that says we can put a slur over melisma notes. Mm -hmm. um, that tradition exists. It's not necessarily a, a given. Not like the, the melisma line is pretty well universal. The slur is somewhat less so. It's more like a nice to sometimes do also, but not everyone uses it because it does have the potential to add clutter to the score. And so if you're going to have a lot of other markings in the score, sometimes the slurs are like, ooh, that's just going to kind of get in the way, um, especially when they're big, long melismas like this. So sometimes you'll see uh, no slurs, but, but it is definitely the case that sometimes you see the slurs. This also relates to the thing I talked about last time with eighth notes, where... Um, with eighth notes, the tradition is that uh, that we would beam together if this was going to be high, that I would beam those eighth notes together to indicate that it was a melisma. But if it was uh, instead, if it was this, uh, um, Hi there, how are you? That we don't beam them together, and instead we uh, open the beam properties palette and set them to be individual notes like that. So that's another uh, kind of an old school way of doing things. I would say most, well, maybe you all can tell me more. A lot of choral music published in the last 50 years or so doesn't do this anymore. We actually beam the way it's done for instrumental music, which is, you know, not paying attention to lyrics because, well, instrumental music doesn't have lyrics, but at least some music does. Um, and before I forget, I want to show you one thing before I sign off. Uh, and that is a book that I find to be useful. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a uh, choral arranging by Holly Aids or Otis. Um, can't tell you uh, how his name is pronounced either. There you go. Yeah. 
it's I can see it in, in the, the cafe video there. So great. So anyhow, it's it's a really good book on choral arranging. Um, and uh, I, I have a, a number of different books on arranging and orchestration and theory and so forth. And this is one that really gets into the specific subject of arranging for choral ensembles that I, I think you all might um, find useful. So, um, oh, the slur shouldn't include the hello. Yes, you're right. It's a uh, boink. There we go. Uh, slurs are mandatory for vocal writing. Gould says so. Well... Okay, if Gould says so, then it's true in her world. I will just say I've encountered any amount of choral music that doesn't do that in the jazz world. So her, she probably doesn't have a whole lot of experience in uh, in uh, that world. But okay, uh, I, I've definitely seen the slurs omitted f fairly often in in uh, vocal jazz scores. Uh, maybe it's just because a lot of those are tend to be self produced. Um, you know, published by university uh, publishing houses and things like that. Um, but in any case, I will say a tradition exists of it, good or not, of 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 not doing the slurs in a lot of uh, recently published vocal jazz music. Um, but okay, uh, far bit for me to disagree with Gould. So I will say, unless you unless you are working in a world where you know that the slurs are not used, use the slurs. So there you go. Yeah, unless you're working in a world where you know they're not used, use them. So, uh, okay, see if I've missed anything else here. Um, oh, and I see in, in the mystery pronunciation piece. So, yeah, when we look at that, I'll, I'll look at, uh, um, there's, oh, is, oh, yeah, so this is a thing. Sometimes there's one syllable words, and I think I mentioned this last time in context of the word fire. Where fire is one syllable technically, but fire, you're going to pronounce it as if it was two. And is, you kind of want to think of is, and then the z doesn't come until the end. And so that is another uh, thing that's actually worth mentioning. When it's only two eighth notes like this, I would agree, is, and then. So this, if I changed it to uh, is, I guess I have to delete that lyric is like that would be would be better. But if you think about this, if you really did want to sing is you wouldn't actually try to put the s sound until the last note. So notating it this way is misleading and uh Holly here actually addresses that concept somewhere in there i'm pretty sure and i think actually gould does as well where there where you know if there's situations like that where the consonant really doesn't sound until the end and you think it's going to be confusing then then you might want to deal with that separately but i think there's no uh um there's uh yeah there, there's probably no one way of doing it but it is something to be aware of that it does happen so yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to just accept that for slurs that you should leave that you should include them, and that the people who don't include them are doing it for bad reasons, and that I shouldn't I shouldn't look to their scores for inspiration, but I will just say that it it happens, and so uh, if singers are going to be confused, then uh, then uh, that is good to know. I don't like to confuse people, so I'm I'm going to be including my slurs. All right, so I think I'm going to wrap up here and we can continue with more questions and things and more conversation next time. Um, oh, wow, check that out. Oh, gosh, I really, YouTube. <laughs> okay, I got to do this, right? Because it's going to be too fun. Um, uh, so, youtube.com. And then I think it was slash uh, watch and then V equals this, right? Ah! Question mark V. I got the question mark, right? Dang it. Too many V's. 
I would love to be able to get that, but I'll get it for next time because I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm obviously doing this wrong. So in any case, um, watch. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get that by next time. So anyhow, thanks everyone for being here. And we'll just pick up and look at more of this kind of stuff next week. By the way, I want to, I'm going to leave you with uh, two things. Uh, one is I'm looking at doing additional sessions. So we've got the Musecore Cafe. It's the time it is. It's been the same time, same day ever since I started. SQ at the end. I missed the SQ. Oh, gosh. Okay. Obviously, I'm still screwing things up. RSQ. Um, question mark. Annoying. But... Slash wash question V. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Um, uppercase Q. Uppercase Q. Since when do... Uh, I guess that's not part of the real URL. Uh, okay. Let's rewind this thing and actually find out. Geis. Seriously? Geis. Geis. Okay. Geis. Christ, that's my, my best guess at that. All right, never would have guessed. Thank you. Um, so, uh, okay, so the time for this, I'm not probably going to change because it, it is what it is. It's working okay. But I'm looking at expanding and doing some more different kinds of sessions. And I would be curious to hear from people. You can just leave in comments uh, on this video. Uh, what other times and did uh, work for people because I obviously we're scattered all around the world and it's impossible to find times that work for everyone but I am kind of curious what times work best for people I'd love to know ba both what local time works for you and what that translates into as far as GMT or Eastern Standard Time um, so uh, I, I'm curious about that to know if there's uh, you know other times I should be shooting for for other sessions that I might do. And the other thing I want to tell you is that Harmony course. Uh, I sent you a link to that, and I'll put that link in the comments again. Uh, it's getting ready to launch because it's just about done. And so if you want in on the original price that I had as the pre-launch price, which is a fraction of what the final price will be and is going to be an amazing deal, uh, I would go ahead and do that uh, before. Uh, um, uh, you know, do that while the getting's good. So, uh, yeah, good to know that's this, but it's, it's, it's long in the middle of the day for people who are working and I know that. So, um, but you know, I did plan it to be so that it would be sometime during the day for a lot of people. Okay. So I, I'll put the, I'll put the link to where you can, uh, get the, uh, um, the Harmony course at the uh, original price and all that. And of course, all those free previews are still there also. So anyhow, uh, I, I'm curious about things like that. So feel free to leave further comments in uh, comments, but I am going to sign off here because we've been going on more than long enough and I will see everyone next time. So thanks everyone. Thanks Kirk for the wonderful piece that we got to spend so much time looking at there and uh, keep, keep, keep them coming. I, I look forward to checking out more people's submissions. Okay. See ya.